What's going on everybody? We just finished another dynamic service. We talked from the subject title, Ready, Set, Go. Sometimes we're ready, sometimes we want to go, but God takes time to set us. And many times we try to avoid that setting. Well, specifically, we talk from the subject title running behind because there's so many times we feel like we're behind of schedule, whether it be with our jobs, our careers, even life, our purpose. And so I want to show you that God's timing is always perfect and you may not be behind. You may be further along than you think. So you've got to check out the message in its entirety. I know it's going to be an encouragement to you. As always, I want to thank you for joining Evangel Nation. I want to thank you for liking, for sharing, for commenting. I want to thank you for your commitment to helping us to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to a world. You are part of the Great Commission. Listen, this is still the year of connections with God, others, and purpose. And in the days to come, let's continue to build. Let's stay connected. Peace. I want to invite your attention to 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 19 through 23. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. Again, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 19 through 23. It reads, Now Ahimez, son of Zadok, said, Let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has vindicated him by delivering him from the hand of his enemies. You are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to a Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, again said to Joab, come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. But Joab replied, my son, why do you want to go? You don't have news that will bring you a reward. He said, come what may, I want to run. So Joab said, run. Then Ahimaaz ran by way of the plain and outran the Cushite. I want to take a few moments just to talk from the subject title, running behind, running behind, running behind. There's a few things I want to establish first is that many times in scriptures, the word race is used as a metaphor to describe life. And if you've ever been in any race, competition, contest, it is the organizer's job to identify and provide a course. Before they ever recruit a runner, they already know the course. And many of them have already traveled the course, so they know every curve. They know every obstacle. They know every challenge that will be present on the course. Before they ever call one runner. And I believe that's just like God, that before we even entered this place we call earth. That he already had prepared good works for us to perform. And this is exciting that we serve a God that is recruiting runners for a race he's already won. But even more, God does not just control the runner. He does not just direct the runner, but he also directs the path. Y'all don't believe me, do you? The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your path. Isn't that amazing that God not only directs you, but he directs what you run on? Let me try that. That wasn't a good enough response. I said, God is so amazing that he does not just direct you, but he directs the path. In fact, the Bible says that he can make your path straight. This reminds us again that it's a fixed fight because any God that can control the runner in the path is a God I want to serve. 
Even Job says he knows the path that I take, and when I'm tried, I'll come forth as pure gold. So God's just as familiar with the path as he's familiar with the runner. So he's already created a path because God orders both of them. And and the truth of the matter is, according to Paul, if a race is set before us, we must begin to see ourselves as runners. Again, the Bible does not encourage us to solely run with speed, but the Bible reminds us also to run with patience. I think the problem with many of us is that we have overlooked that caveat because we're so interested in getting there that we don't realize that in many cases God is trying to teach us lessons along the way. And so the Bible does not instruct us to run with speed, but patience. Out of all the things that the Bible instructs us to fix, doesn't instruct us necessarily to fix our heart because God is the heart fixer. But if you're going to be an effective runner, the Bible does encourage us to fix our eyes. Yeah, you got to fix your focus. The Bible says we fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who kept his eyes on the joy that was set before him. If you're going to run and finish this race, you got to fix your eyes. Because what you're looking at can determine whether you finish or whether you fail. Look at somebody say, fix your eyes. I believe if you can fix your eyes, you'll fix your face. So they look at me and say, fix your eyes. And God will fix your face. And so it tells us to fix our eyes for the race. The Bible suggests that one of our biggest opponents is going to be ourselves. And so, many of us have experienced running behind. When you expected something to appear in one season, and it seems like God has delayed it, or postponed it, or maybe even canceled it for another season. We all felt like we had running behind. I don't know if you've ever been running behind going to work or going to a meeting. Some of y'all say, yes, I understand, Pastor. It it creates anxiety in you when you feel like you're running behind. Makes you feel as if you're failing when you're running behind. But as we look at this text, we understand that this is a story. Story of David and his kingship. David is at odds with his son, Absalom. Because he would not handle his brother Amnon, who raped his sister Tamar. And because David mismanaged his family ties, Absalom sets himself up against David. And he creates an atmosphere of insurrection. The Bible says that Absalom was a handsome man. If the Bible says you're handsome, you can take that to the bank and cash it. The Bible says you're a simple man. That means you were just simple. But it makes it very clear that Absalom was a handsome man. And uh, so Absalom's a handsome man. He's beautiful. He's arrogant. The Bible says one day he's running through the forest. And his hair... It's long. Let me say this. Uh, Absalom's hair was long. In fact, uh, it was very long. He only cut his hair maybe once a year. And so his hair was constantly down his back. And as a result of his hair, he's hung in a tree. Can I prophesy and say this to you? Sometimes what you refuse to cut will hang you. The reason some of us are hung is because of what we refuse to cut. There's some things you have to sever so that you can make forward progress in the season that you're in. And Absalom refused to cut his hair. And as a result, Absalom was hung. 
There's a man by the name of Joab, who is a general, who tells his men to kill Absalom, even though he knows he has instructions from David to preserve him. And so he kills him because, watch this, you can't run until you first kill certain things. Because many times, the thing you're trying to avoid is the thing that's going to give you victory. And so, Ephraim is this forest name, which means that I was fruitful in the place of my affliction. This is the thing I love about God, is that God will make you fruitful in an unconvenient environment. Now, hear this. So, Absalom is killed by Joab. Joab now has to communicate after he's buried Absalom to David what has already transpired. There is a man that is already used to carrying news. His name is Ahimus to David because he's done it in the past. But Joab asks for someone else. Watch this. I want you to understand this, that the Cushite is selected. The Cushite is selected. And selections are always strategic. Selections are not by accident. Selections are by providence. And I love this because he does it strategically because he calls someone outside of the king's circle. See, I want to prophesy to you for a moment. Some of us are trying to fit in circles that God has strategically kept us out of. Because if you're in the circle, it'll make your assignment null and void. This is why they won't make room for you because watch this. Joab knows that David won't receive this news well. So he doesn't want to send a friend. He wants to send someone who does not have relationship, someone that's not in the circle. And I came to prophesy to you that the reason you've been kept out is because God is trying to bring you in. And so even though he's kept outside of the circle, God still has a significant purpose and destiny for his life. Because some of the circles you're trying to join would disqualify you from being a blessing in the next season of your life. I love this about this Kushite runner is that he was ordered by a commander. He was ordered. The Bible says this and you know it's true. He says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. In other words, this man was not just running. This man had marching orders. And I want to submit this to you, uh, that God can give you orders, but that doesn't mean your orders won't be observed. And this is where criticism comes into play, when your orders don't always meet the standards of man. This is when people begin to underestimate you when God's orders don't make sense to them. And so this man is running because he has orders. And he's been strategically selected. Now the Bible says that every step, steps represent decisions. So every decision of a righteous man is ordered by God. And, and your orders really express your desire. You don't go to Chick-fil-A and order something you don't want. I hope you don't. Then I'm really going to have to pray for you. You, you. you don't go to McDonald's that loves to make you smile and order what you don't want. Orders always communicate desires. And so when God gives us an order, he's communicating his desire for us. The Bible says that he'll give you the desires of your heart when God orders you. So every step of a righteous man, even though he's making a decision, he's walking in God's desires. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, I want to make sure that I am walking in the places that God desires for me. I, I made too many mistakes in my past just 
wondering, but this is the season you got to walk in purpose. You got to walk in destiny. You got to walk in God's plan for your life. And the thing I love about walking in orders is that every order God makes, he pays for. Well, let me preach to somebody who doesn't understand that if it's God's will, it's God's bill. I want to preach to somebody that understands that no man goes to war at his own expense, but God has you covered. See, that's what I love about ordering and God ordering my steps is that there's some things I don't have to pay for. There's some things I don't have to worry about. As soon as I get to one spot, if I'm ordered, God allows favor to meet me because every step of a good man is ordered. And whatever God orders, he pays for. Look at somebody say, whatever God orders. Orders, he pays for because God always pays for his orders that's why some of you are driving what you're driving because God pays for his orders some of you have the businesses you have because God pays for his orders some of you have the family you have because God pays for his orders the truth of the matter is God won't order something that he's not willing to pay for so watch this success Is not promised to the best and the brightest. Success from God's perspective is guaranteed to those whose steps are ordered. I want you to know this, that there was another man, Ahimez, who jumps the gun. He he didn't have his steps ordered. And so because he didn't have his steps ordered, he does not have the same grace that the Cushite has. I want you to understand that the Kushite does not have any pedigree. The Kushite is not as popular. It has not been tested as often as the former runner. But one thing the Kushite has is an order. And can I prophesy to you the difference in your life this year will be that you're following orders. Oh, I guess some people have just gone rogue. But the truth of the matter is God is looking for some people who will follow orders orders because watch this sometimes God will give you running orders and sometimes God will give you restraining orders and sometimes we tell we can tell how mature you are by how you handle your restraining orders everybody wants to run but what happens when your general tells you today is not the day that you can't run today how do you respond to God's restraining orders. That's why some of you are frustrated right now because God has you under some restraining orders. You want to run on it. God said, not now. But I never want you to confuse not now with not ever. Even though you're under some restraining orders. Because restraining orders many times is an opportunity to test you, to make you, to shape you, and to mold you. I want to give you three ways that ordered runners arrive. And I want you to hear me. First of all, all, ordered runners arrive in their lane. Yeah, ordered runners arrive in their lane. Look at somebody say, stay in your lane. The race is set. This means someone's hand went before the runner. If we are going to run to win, we got to stay in our lanes. And there's three types of lanes. There's your lane. There's others lanes. And then there's God's lane. And you got to make sure that you're disciplined enough to stay in your lane. Because when you cross over into somebody else's lane, you stand the chance of being disqualified. You stand the chance of a wreck. And this is why some of our lives are a wreck because we have not committed to running in our lane. You won't be victorious outside of your lane. Can I prophesy to somebody? You're not anointed outside of your lane. You're not anointed to do everything. You're anointed to do something. Let me remind you that this is the year where we connect with God, others, and purpose. And if you're going to walk in purpose, you got to run in your lane. Look at somebody say, this year you got to stay in your lane. 
going to take discipline. I know other people's lanes look attractive. I know other people's lanes look ripe. But you got to be disciplined enough to stay in your lane. And you definitely don't want to cross over into God's lane because God does stuff above your pay grade. And I've learned this. Every day you allow God to be God, you don't have to be God yourself. So I've learned to allow God to fight battles that I couldn't win in my own might. I've learned to stay in my lane. Some of y'all translated it like this. If I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle, I know victory shall be mine. Watch somebody right now and tell them, say, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. We've had too many wrecks. That's why you've never finished because you had a wreck because you got out of your lane. There were a group of young prophets, young priests who offered up fire, but they offered up strange fire because they were not authorized to do it because they wouldn't stay in their lane. The reason Saul loses the kingdom is because he tries to be king, prophet, and priest. He wouldn't just stay in his lane and wait on Samuel, and he lost it all because he wouldn't stay in his lane. People can see your anointing when you're willing to stay in your lane. You got to make up your mind. You're going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the things of God because you're staying in your lane. Amen. And the grass always looks greener on the other side, but you got to be dedicated to stay in your lane. And you know, when you get weary and tired, the greatest temptation is to cross over into someone else's So the truth of the matter is, lanes do something for us. First of all, lanes create separation. Lanes even give you an opportunity for speed. Because you could not speed like you speed without lanes. And lanes provide safety. Because the safest place in the whole wide world is the wheel of God. You got to learn to stay in your lane. So anointed runners arrive in their lane. Anointed runners arrive last. Ooh, I knew y'all didn't see that coming. Y'all got the lane part. But when you're really anointed, many times God will allow you to arrive last. Watch this. Ahinam, he arrives Ahimus arrives, but watch this, early, but he was not anointed for the assignment. The anointing is when God lends you his ability. So even though the fastest runner was gifted, he was not graced. Even though he was fast, he could not finish. Sometimes God will allow anointed runners to finish what seems to be last. He, he allowed Adam to come first and allowed Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, to come last. Because when you're anointed, you can't be afraid to finish last. When he came to David's house, he said, the oil is not going to flow until I see the king. You have to understand this, that seven brothers went before David. David was the eighth brother. He was last, but he definitely wasn't least. It is something about God that will allow your anointing to be revealed last. This is why some of you are frustrated because you feel like it's taking too long for God to do what he said he was going to do. But don't you know this? Just like he did in John chapter 2, he saves the best for last. Look at somebody say, God saves the best for last. See, they've been drinking that cheap stuff, but when God turns water into wine, he's going to save the best wine for last. And look at somebody say, I'm blessed by the best. So when you're anointed, you got to be okay with finishing last. The, the, the text tells us that Ahimaaz finishes 
seemingly before the Cushite runner. But you got to be reminded that the Cushite runner is order. And not only lasts, but you got to get used to finishing late. Somebody say, get used to finishing late. Most of the time, anointed people seem to be late bloomers. See, we think the anointing is going to make us finish early. But sometimes the anointing gives you the endurance to finish late because the goal is not to finish with speed, it's to finish with patience. And I came to prophesy that everybody feels like you're anointed. Get ready to finish later than you expected. But look at somebody say, I'm ordered, I'm ordered. I'm ordered. That's why I got peace like a river because I'm ordered. That's why I'm not concerned because I'm ordered. I didn't call myself. God called me. I'm ordered. Look at somebody say, I'm still under God's orders. So late. I want to remind you that waiting your turn is not wasting your time. See, when we don't want to finish late, we'll jump the gun. Like a hearing does in the text because we don't want to finish late. But when you're anointed, you finish late. Understand this. Abraham and Sarah were anointed. Abraham is the father of of our faith. Some people say he's the father of three different religions. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And God has a seed. He says and the, all the earth is going to be blessed through your seed. And so he produces a seed. There's only one problem. He produces it late. He produces it late. Can I prophesy to you that usually when your steps are ordered and you're late, that means you're about to produce something. This is why one of the dreaded things men want to hear when they're not married is I'm late. Because it means I'm about to produce something that I couldn't produce before. And God says, listen, just because you're late does not mean I won't birth what I said I was going to birth in your life. Abraham is late. But he still gives birth. And Abraham's seed is still in the earth. And Abraham's seed is still blessed. Because just because you're late doesn't mean that you lose your value. Don't let anybody underestimate you just because you're not on their timing. Because lateness is relative. Because a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And so God is the God that's on time. That means he's not restricted to the same things that you're restricted to. We serve an on time God. I need you to say yes he is. Joseph arrived late by man's standards. It was a whole decade before he becomes second in command. Even though his brothers were enjoying the luxury of having their father, they, uh, Joseph was estranged. And the truth of the matter is that he has one day a favor when he's in the prison because God will still perform even if it's late because God's delay is not his denial. It was David who had a prophecy but arrives as kingship 13 years later because God will allow you to show up late when you are anointed Jesus can I preach Jesus shows up four days late because when you're anointed you're not on man's time shall I hear what I said Jesus shows up four days late but because he's anointed, he's able to show them another size, side of God. I'm not just a healer, but I'm also a resurrector. Matter of fact, I'm the resurrection. So all Lazarus has to do is come forth once you remove the stone. Because the truth of the matter is anointed people show up late, but they always show up prepared. Look at somebody and say, I may be late, but I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to preach that a little bit later. I may be late, but I'm always prepared. 
Again, late is relative. Because some of the things you think are late are really in the timing of God. Some of y'all so mad, y'all like, if it's late, I don't even want it. But I say better late than never. And so, watch this. This Cushite runner is running behind. This Cushite runner is running behind. He's already got orders. But Hennis says, I want to run too. And Hennis, the Bible says, he runs beside him and behind him and before him. And he passes him. And as a result, this Cushite runner is ordered, but he's behind. What happens when you're ordered and you're also behind? What, what happens when God gave you an assignment, but it seems like you're running behind on the assignment that he gave you? And again, running behind is do something later than playing or respect it. But I came to prophesy that this is the difference. He's running behind because the hindrance took a shortcut. The Bible says that he goes through the plains. That means he skips the hills. He skips the mountains that took him to David's gate. He skips it. See, that's the problem. Some of you, you're frustrated because somebody ran past you because they took a different path than you. And it seems like every time you try to climb a mountain or a hill, you have to deal with some minor setbacks. You have to slide back down and try again and slide back down and try again and slide back down and try again. And one of the most frustrating things is when somebody passes you that started after you. But this man is still ordered even though he's running from behind. He's still ordered even though he's running from behind. And if he's ordered from running from behind, you're ordered running from behind. See, I'm ordered even though I'm running from behind. I want you to understand this, that you can be behind a person and not be behind in purpose. See, see, here's the problem. This man would have stopped running if he thought he was behind in purpose just because he was behind a person. I want you to know this, that sometimes it takes more discipline not to quit when you're running behind. Watch, he was, he was running behind based upon a comparison, but he was not running behind based upon a calling. Let me, let me help y'all. Let me help you. Let me leave, let me leave park here for a second. Because some of y'all are like y'all super saved and you never compare yourself. I feel you, player. But the truth of the matter is all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, now. Let me go ahead and say this. This is Olympic season. They're doing the trials. They're getting people prepared for the Olympics. I don't know about you. But if it's me, and I feel like I'm not going to finish first, my pride tells me, why don't you just go to the sideline? <laughs> Either you're number one or you're number zero. If you're not first, you're last. Think about, think about how much courage it takes for somebody to finish last. Because we celebrate the person that finishes first. But we don't celebrate the person that finishes last. Paul never says, I finished first. He says, I finished my course. And it takes more guts when you see everybody running in front of you to say, even though I'm not finishing with them, I'm determined to finish. And that's the trick of the enemy. He'll always keep somebody in front of you that will discourage you from running and seeing what the end is going to be. So psychologically, I'm like, I'm not running to lose. I'm just going to be on the sideline sipping on some Gatorade. 
because the winner has already been declared. So why keep running? Yeah, she took my man. Why keep running? They already found somebody for the job. Why keep running? Somebody already filled the space. Why keep running? Some of y'all not like me. I'm a competitor. I don't like to lose. It's embarrassing to cross the line. Like, some of y'all are like y'all always been first. I'm talking to the people who did not finish when you wanted to finish. See, some of y'all graduated in four years, but some of y'all it took six years. I'm talking to the people that didn't finish as quick as you wanted to finish. Some of y'all got discouraged because you're like, look at this young person so far ahead of me. They started behind me. I'm going to have to be their daddy, and I feel like I'm a failure because they seem to be ahead of me. Because sometimes somebody ahead of you can make you feel feelings you never thought you had before. But I came to prophesy to you again that you're not behind based upon calling. You're just behind based upon comparison. Hannah was not behind Paniah, but she was behind based upon comparison, but not based upon calling. John understood his calling so much that when him and Jesus was running beside each other, he said, I must decrease that he might increase. I'm going to fall back because I know my assignment. Because I'm not running as a competition. The only competition I have is with myself. I'm one of one. And when you're number one, according to Dr. Seuss, you'll always be odd. You're number one, but that doesn't always mean you're going to be first. Because it's set before you a race. Every man has his race. So I started asking myself, I said, why don't these people give up? If it's eight runners and I'm number eight, does it even matter that I finish? Then I thought about it. I said, the Olympics, they're running for more than themselves. They're not running because they volunteered. They're running because somebody called them. And so they have to complete the call. I'm not the fastest, but you called me. I'm not the swiftest, but you called me. Not the most talented, but you called me. And my responsibility to my country is not always to win, but to respond to the call. Can I prophesy to you? Sometimes winning looks like losing with God, and losing looks like winning with God. And your responsibility is not always to finish when you want to finish, but it's to respond to the call and to fulfill the call of God on your life. Because faithful is he that called you. It was also do. Can I tell you, I, I faced some dark days, but the reason I kept on running is because I had a calling. See, when you have a calling, you don't have to take responsibility. You, you can do a lynch and say, listen, I'm just here so I won't get fined. I was called here. I was summoned here. You can finish first, but I'm not here to beat you. I'm here to fulfill a calling. I'm here to fulfill an assignment. And so faithful is he that gave me the assignment that's going to give me the grace to fulfill the assignment. So whether I come in first or eighth, I'm going to finish the assignment. This is the way that the saints have to view even that run with the Lord Jesus Christ is that he called me so you can't cancel me. How are you going to let a runner ahead of you cancel your assignment when they didn't call you in the first place? And they run with the person that called them on their chest. Matter of fact, you don't even see their name on their chest. You just see who called them on their chest. And some of us start running because we forgot who called us. So, I'm running. <laughs> I experienced church hurt. Does that give me an excuse to stop running? Not unless the person that calls me calls back and says, you don't have to run anymore. 
But if I'm still called to run, he anticipated I might get hurt. So even the hurdle doesn't have enough power to keep me from moving forward. I get rejected. Boom, another hurdle. Does that give me an excuse to stop running? No, if that doesn't change the color. Can I say this? Man's ability doesn't change God's ability. You got to keep on. See, I think the problem is we're not convinced we're called. Because as soon as we trip, we think we're sponsoring ourselves. And we forget about who called us. Because in ministry, some people hurt your feelings like you ain't never been hurt before. I went through a season where I was grieving. And people was competing for who could grieve the most. And I had to remember, this is a calling. And so even though they don't approve of me, they can't cancel me because they didn't call me. And some of y'all looking for too many people's approval. And that's why you start running every time you trip. But if they didn't call you, they can't cancel you. This is why even after David falls with Bathsheba, they can't cancel David because they didn't call David. Because the only person that can cancel me is the person that called me. This is why even though you've been a bad father half of your life, if God's call is still on your life, you can't allow anybody to cancel you from your assignment. And the truth of the matter is some of us are canceled not because God did it, because we canceled ourselves. Because we didn't recognize we were running based upon a call and not based upon a convenience. Those individuals take pride in their country. That's why they finished last, because they realized that they were called by a greater power. And every now and then, when it seems like you're finishing last, you got to know that you're called by a greater power. I got to get out of here. Let me get out of here. Let me get out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because even the tortoise in the hair, the tortoise kept on running. Because he refused to allow the hare's position to cancel him. Yeah, he didn't believe he was faster than the hare, but it didn't take speed to win the race. He didn't try to hop like the hare, but because he didn't require hopping to win. What you think the race requires, it doesn't require. All it requires is an order. I came to tell you, if all you have is a word, that's all you need. Look at somebody say, keep running. I feel like preaching for a second. Say, keep running. I want you to know as we look at this story, as we bring ourselves to a close, we understand that they're running. And it seems like Cushite is going to finish last because it seems like the runner is ahead of him. And what happens is they begin to celebrate the victory prematurely. And him as he gets to the king, and the king asks him a question. He says, listen, we won the battle. He says, how is my son Absalom? And he's not qualified to answer the question because he was not ordered, so he went unprepared. So what David tells him, he says, since you can't answer my question, move to the side. To the left. That's what he said. He said, move to the side since you can't answer my question. I came to tell you that the reason you have to go through what you're going through is because of what God has called you to. And what you went through prepared you for where you're going. This is why you can't let what's ahead of you keep you from pressing forward. After all you've been through, God has been faithful. And if God brought you over the mountain, surely God will help you to finish the race. And so watch this, because this man wouldn't stop running, it start, some communication start taking place. And so watch me that says, I see one runner. I now see two runners. Can I prophesy to you that if you keep on running, somebody's looking out for you. 
and somebody's talking about you right now. They see you before you arrive. Can I prophesy to you? This is the season God's about to put your name in the wind. That before you arrive, somebody's going to be mentioning your name. And I love this because you see the watchman, he starts talking to the gatekeeper. And some of y'all are facing some situations that seems like people have kept you out of. But when you're running out of orders, when you're running from favor, he'll have a watchman to start talking to the gatekeeper. And doors that seem like they wouldn't open begin to be open because God can open a door that no man can shut. And he can shut a door that no man can open. Can I prophesy to you that you're about to catch up and what you thought was out of reach. God's about to bring you into a place of destiny. God's about to bring you into a place of purpose. I just need about 10 people who believe the word of the Lord just to stand to your feet and give God some glory. Why don't you high five somebody say God's about to open the door. God's about to make a way. Don't you give up because the race is not given to the swift nor the battle to the strong. But if you keep on running, sooner or later things are going to work in your favor. That wasn't the right person. Go ahead and high five somebody else and say you're about to catch up. I see doors opening for you. I see God making a way for you. I see things that were blocked. God's about to make an entrance. You're looking at a wall, but you can't see the gate. God's about to make a way out of no way if you would just trust God. And one thing I learned about God is that the way we enter his gates is with thanksgiving. We come before his courts with praise. If you know a gate's about to open for you, I want you to take the next 20 seconds and give God some glory. I need you to praise him until something shakes. I need you to praise him until something breaks. I need you to praise him until something shifts. I may be behind now, but don't you underestimate me. Don't you underestimate me. Because they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm still going to make it. Why don't you help me prophesy and just high five somebody and say, catch up, catch up, catch up, catch up, catch up, catch up. I don't care what's ahead of you. Do you know who's behind you? Catch up. They missed it, so I'm going to keep on prophesying and tell witnesses to your spirit. I said, catch up. I said, catch up. I said, catch up. I know you're in the red right now, but God can bring you to the black. Catch up. I know you on stage three, but God can reverse the curse. Catch up. Come on, if you're going in the gate, you got to give God some praise. If you're going in the gate, you got to give God some praise. Should not prevail. I'm ordered. Whatever God has for me, you can't keep me out of. I'm ordered. I said, I said, I'm ordered. Let me talk to somebody. I know what it's like for people that's behind you that started after you. It seems like they finished it before you. And it discourages you from running. Because you're like, God, what's the point? It seems like you're running in place. But it's something about this Cushite runner that Joab could see something in the Cushite runner that he could not see in himself. He saw his endurance. And can you run in spite of what it looks like? Can you believe God in spite of what it looks like? Can you stay faithful and consistent in spite of what it looks like? 
Sometimes we're so focused on what's ahead of us that we forget who's behind us. For every mountain he brought you over. For every valley he brought you through. That, that was to create a momentum so you could get to the destination. You didn't take a shortcut. But God was teaching you faithless he that promise that will also do it. You know what stops some of us running? It's because of what we envisioned in our future. But I came to tell you that it's not as bad as it seems. David said this, because you were unprepared, I'm going to tell you to move to your side. This season, the reason God's taking so long, because the worst thing that could happen is you arrive at an opportunity and be unprepared. And this is why some of us are sidelined, because we had an opportunity we were unprepared for. And so the running prepares you. It's not all about the destination. Sometimes it's about the process. How many of us get tired of running? But you got to remember who called you. Because even though you're running behind, if God ordered you, you still can finish. And I hope you can hear this. I know it's a lot of celebration. But if you look at the text, David is in between two gates. And there's a watchman that sees the runner before he's arrived. Somebody sees what you're running. Somebody sees your effort. Somebody sees your contribution. Some of y'all, your supervisors is watching you right now and you don't even know he's watching you. Just because he's not talking to you doesn't mean he's not watching you. But he talks to the gatekeeper who determines who gets in and who gets out. And so this man is able to run through a gate because he didn't give up. Some of you even with salvation, you've been running for a long time. Some of you gave up because it's like people were getting ahead and God wasn't moving as fast as you thought he would move and you gave up and you got out the race. Watch this. Paul makes it very clear that nobody else can disqualify me. The only person that can disqualify me from the race is me. And some of you, God didn't cancel you, but you canceled yourself. And I want to give you an opportunity on today to get back in the race. To run again. That if God called you, I can still hear the echo. And God will always finish what he started. 